Well, as we know, in the American Revolution, just like most all other wars, the flag or banner was used as a rallying cry of purpose. It was something that could be seen as the soldiers marched in. It reminded them of the purpose of why they were fighting. When the challenge got really difficult, when the war and the battle raged on, it was the sight of the banner, the sight of the flag that would remind them of no retreats. There's a reason why we are moving forward. There's a reason for the cause. And many times this flag, this country's flag, or many times we see the flag raised up on ships, even like the pirate ships put their flag up. There's this sense of when we are moving forward, this is a reminder of why. This is the motivation of what we are doing and why we are doing. It's a visual reminder of why we're in the fight. A visual reminder of the cause. A visual reminder that there are times. There are times that you're going to have to push forward in battles. In that clip, we saw this was hand-to-hand -hand combat. They were overmatched, but by the scene of the flag, understanding there is something worth fighting for. There's a motivation, and I see it. And this banner, this symbol of protection, this symbol of purpose is a visual reminder. Again, this idea of motivation. So today, as we continue on in our series, looking at the, the names of God, today we're going to look at Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Nisi. I'm going to tell the story where Moses builds the altar and says, God is my banner, or the Lord is my banner. We see this term, this phrase, my banner, or banner used throughout the Old Testament. It's a signal flag. It's a standard pole, it's a sail, it's a sign, absolutely used in the Old Testament for battles, for the understanding of, again, the purpose of why we are moving. But also the same word is used different places in the Old Testament. I'll give you a couple. Psalms chapter 60. You have given a banner, same word, to those who fear you, that it may be displayed because of the truth. It's displayed. That your beloved may be rescued, save us with your right hand, and answer us. Same word. Jeremiah 4, 6. Raise a signal flag as warning for Jerusalem. Flee now. Do not delay, for I am bringing terrible destruction upon you from the north. So when this word is used throughout the Old Testament, again, it's a banner, a signal flag, a, a sign. So why is it, and we're going to see the story, why is it that Moses says, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, or God is my banner. This idea of banner was true in the Old Testament, and we see that. And I want to pause just for a second and make sure we understand that when we're reading through the Old Testament, when you're hearing teaching on the Old Testament, we can absolutely use the Old Testament and the stories. Now, 
There are some these days that I believe make some mistakes when teaching through the Old Testament. You see, we're looking at these incredible stories. We've been looking at all these. I mean, these are amazing stories of what's happening. The mistake we make is when we see ourselves as the hero. When you see yourself in the story and you make the story about yourself or that person believing that you're the hero of the story, like David and Goliath. You've heard that taught, right? Then we begin to see ourselves like we're David. Guess what? You're not David. And when you're going up against a, 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 a giant, you're probably not going to go up against a giant. And on that story in that time, then we can't insert ourselves there and say, every time you go up against a giant, allegory, a giant, you will win the victory. It's not true. You can't do that. So people use the Old Testament stories too many times and insert themselves in the story, which you cannot do specifically. The other extreme is the opposite, where people assume because the Old Testament, because we're not Jews living under the Old Covenant, and now Jesus is here and he's ushered in the New Covenant, the Old Testament has no bearing on us and our lives. And many teachers today, they shy away from the Old Testament. They really don't tell the stories and they disregard what's happening. Many who teach this, Many who teach us, as I watch and listen to them teach that the Old Testament, that's a different time. We're not Jews under the Old Covenant. Many times it's because they want to teach and preach and display a much softer, kinder God. They want to have this idea that there's a God of the Old Testament, but the God of the New Testament, well, he's more like Jesus. As if Jesus and God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, aren't the exact same. So what is the correct way of teaching the Old Testament? The way we do it here, the way we do it here. When teaching the Old Testament, we don't insert yourself, you don't insert yourself as the hero or the person in the story specifically. But listen, we glean wisdom and truth about God. We glean wisdom and truth about God's character, about who God always is and how he relates to us. We can learn biblical principles uh, uh, from focusing on God in his story. So as we watch people interact with God, we can say that's God's character. That's how he responds. We can learn some principles along the way. Why? Because God's divine purpose, his character and love for his creation does not change. I want to make sure we always believe this because there's some different teachings out there. The God of the Old Testament is the same of the New Testament. And Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit, it's all together, and we can't, we don't move into a different type of God in the New Testament because we like the way Jesus looks. He's a little bit like a hippie wearing his Birkin socks, and he just loves everybody. That's the God of the New Testament. It is the God of the New Testament. It's also the same God of the Old Testament. They're all the same. Why? Because God is, here's a big word for you to learn, God is immutable. God is immutable, meaning he is unchanging. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. And Jesus and Theophanies in the Old Testament we talked about, same Jesus that was walking around in the New Testament. Same one, same character, same love. So now that we understand, let's move into today's story. For today's story to make a lot of sense, we got to go back to the beginning of Moses. And Moses has been called of God to go to Egypt Talk to Pharaoh and say, set my people free. They're slaves no longer. Moses goes in. Pharaoh's like, yeah, not happening. So then God sends plagues, plagues that affect Pharaoh's life, his family specifically. Pharaoh's like, I'm done with this, God. Your people can leave. So Moses goes in, and he leads out the nation of Israel, all of God's people. If you want to kind of have an idea of what this looks like, when you've watched on the news when countries are being overtaken by another a country, or maybe there's famine, and you see thousands and thousands of people, they're just leaving the country. They grabbed whatever they could. They have their kids in tow. They got a couple of bags, and they're just leaving. This is the visual of the nation of Israel leaving Egypt. They just got what they could get, grab your kids, and we are now going to march out. We're now going to leave thousands upon thousands following Moses. And as they follow Moses, for a while they're feeling pretty good about being out of Egypt. This is awesome. And then they get to the Red Sea. 
and they look to the left, it's just water. They look to the right, it's just water. There's no ships, there's no boats. So they begin to grumble, but they specifically begin to grumble when they begin to see that Pharaoh has changed his mind. And now the soldiers, real soldiers, are chasing after the nation of Israel, and they're now stuck at the Red Sea. Exodus chapter 14, we pick up the story. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians coming after them. The Israelites were terrified and cried out to the Lord for help. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us to die in the wilderness? Not real grateful, are they? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Isn't this what we told you in Egypt? Leave us alone so that we may serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Better to be a slave, apparently, than to die a free person. But Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the Lord's salvation that he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you must be quiet. The Lord, it's a character trait, the Lord will fight for you. Principle, stop whining. Be quiet. You don't have to doubt God's love for you. He is in control. So the story continues. The, the troops are coming. The Egyptians are coming. Moses then takes his staff that he's holding. You've seen the movie. Charlton Heston pff, touches the water, and the water stands up on end, making a clear path through the Red Sea. And all of the nation of Israel, thousands of people, are hustling through. Here come the bad guys. Here come the Egyptians. And they see also a dry path across the Red Sea. They think if they did it, we can do it too. So they take all of their army, all of their soldiers into the Red Sea. As the last person comes out of the Red Sea, the last Israelite's foot is out of the water. Whoosh! God pushes back the walls. The water comes crashing in. And the, what he had told Moses was true. You're never going to see them again. Moses said, let's go that way. And they continue to march on. Again, these are normal people. These are not trained soldiers. These are people who are slaves. They know how to build pyramids. They know how to farm. They know how to be slaves. But they don't know much else. They're just normal people marching along and moving with Moses. But they're also normal in the sense of when they get out there and a few of the rations they were able to bring... They begin to get hungry. The Bible says they started to whine and complain again. Why would you bring us out here? We don't have any food. So miraculously, God provides manna from heaven, basically drones bringing in food for them. In places where there was no quail, now there's this quail walking around, flat, fat and juicy, and God is providing for them. Fast forward a little bit more, now they're beginning to grumble more because they're thirsty. Chapter 17, the entire Israelite community left the wilderness of sin, moving from one place to the next according to the Lord's command. They camped at Redim, but, but there was no water for the people to drink. So the people complained to Moses, give us water to drink. Why are you complaining to me, Moses replied to them. Why are you testing the Lord? Didn't he say to be quiet? But the people thirsted there for water and grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you ever bring us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with this thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what should I do with these people? In a little while, they're going to stone me. These people are getting furious. They've had enough, and they're looking to me for answers. When you read through that story... Many times we are quick to jump to this idea of, well, I would never do that. I wouldn't. The reality is this. When our physical needs are hurting, when we have physical needs, many times it will cloud our ability to trust in the Lord's goodness and faithfulness. When they were getting thirsty, it was a real need. They were having thirst. But in this sense of a real need, they forgot. What did they forget? Just a couple of days later, Moses sticks his staff in the water. The water stands up. We came across. That's a pretty big deal. 
And then we got hungry, and manna's coming from heaven. Quail, quail everywhere. But when another, listen, when another physical need, when they weren't sure what to do, they forgot God's faithfulness of the past. A pretty quick past. Pretty amazing things that they had seen. We look at this and we're like, man, <laughs> you know, the Israelites are stupid. I'm like, Here's the reality. I do it and you do it too. When all of a sudden we get that phone call, when all of a sudden something happens and it's a challenge, we don't think about the past faithfulness. We focus on our present need. Verse 7. Moses, he named the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites complained and because they were tested, and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord with us? The word Massa means testing in Hebrew. Meribah, grumbling, they're testing, they're grumbling. And they came and they said this. They tested the Lord saying, is the Lord with us or not? Pause there. Well, he got you across the Red Sea. He's bringing you food. But again, we begin to focus on the immediate, and they say the same thing that we say many times. Is the Lord with my family or not? Is the Lord with me? The cry of our heart in times of crisis and confusion is, is the Lord with me or not? Have you ever thought that? Probably not you, but your friend, your neighbor, right? Have you ever thought about that when you look at the circumstance you're in? Things aren't going the way you thought they would be. Could be a real crucible of a time. And in that moment, you're like, God, is this the way you treat people you like? Is the Lord with me or not? If you're a man, when does this really affect us? Even as a single man, definitely as a family man. When you look at the situation and you look at every scenario, and you know you can't fix it. When you can't fix it, it's out of your control. Then all of a sudden, we begin to wonder, God, are you with me or not? Because sometimes, well, God, I don't really need you. I can fix it. But when we have those crucible moments, those times in our life that are challenging, the visual of hand-to-hand -hand combat, when life seems really difficult, many times it's going in a new direction. We're doing something new. We're following the Lord. And while following the Lord, all of a sudden it gets a lot harder than we thought it would be if we were following the Lord. It requires faith. It requires some, some uh, idea, not only faith, but there's some challenge. And so all of a sudden we get thirsty and we forget God keeps bringing manna from heaven. We forget He's already crossed the Red Sea, opened up the Red Sea for us. That's when you and I, it's a cry of our heart. You've been there. I want you to think about when have you been there? When you're just wondering, Lord, are you with me or not? Is the Lord with me or not? The nation of Israel now is coming to Moses. They're like, man, the Red Sea thing was good. The quail's great. We're thirsty. Is God really with us or not? Can he, can we trust him? Can we believe in him? Is he worthy of our life? Listen, is he worthy? We left Egypt. Is he worthy of us following after him? As soon as they asked that question, verse 8, then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, here's what you need to know. It's the first time Joshua is mentioned in the Old Testament. Joshua becomes a player. Joshua is a warrior. He's a major leader. First time he's mentioned is right here. Moses said to Joshua, choose men for us and go out. Fight against Amalek, and tomorrow I will station myself on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Why would he say that? Why would he say that? Look, everybody look up here. Why would he say that? He said that because he knows a battle's coming. And he's going to take the image that they understand, which is the staff. The same staff that touched the water, it split. The same staff that touches a rock and water comes out of it. It's Moses' staff. It represents God's power. It represents his, his, his uh, sense of security, right, his purpose. 
And so Moses said, the fight is coming. The fight is coming, so I'm going to get to the hill so that you can see me. I'm bringing Aaron and her with me, and I'm going to take the staff. I'm going to get to a high point. Why? So that when the battle begins to rage, when you want to retreat, when you're not sure it's worth it, when you're not sure you can make it one more uh, minute in this battle, I want you to be able to look up. I want you to be able to look up and see. This happens all the time. There's definitely an American famous battle. Here's a picture of Mount Sarabachi. You've seen this before. This is the mountain. This is actually a live picture. Well, it was here in the Battle of Iwo Jima that the Marines began to hit the coast. And as they hit the coast, they were, they were sloshing through volcanic sand. And as they're sloshing through the sand, soon, once they've been kind of baited in, the gunfire begins. And now one in three Marines will die. In 24 hours, 4,000. Marines will die on that beach in the black volcanic sand. And when the battle was raging, when in their minds they wanted to go back in the ocean, when they didn't think they could go one more step, in the middle of the battle, a commander says, listen, take a group, get our flag, and get to the top of Mount Sarabachi. And they put the flag up, the famous Iwo Jima flag. The battle was still raging. They hadn't won. It was going to go on for more days. Why put the flag up there? Because when you were moving forward as a soldier and you're watching people die and it's brutal and you're wondering, is this worth it? And then you see the banner. Then you see the flag and you're like, it's absolutely worth. I'm here for my family. I'm here to so my kids can be raised in freedom. And so, yeah, I'm scared. I'm going to move forward. There will be no retreats today. I am moving forward. And when I see the flag, it reminds me of the purpose. It reminds me of the motivation of why I'm here. Did they want to be there? No. But they had this idea of, of of, of, of duty, a duty of a sense of honor, and that flag becomes the pole, the signal pole. It becomes the banner to say, "Keep fighting, keep moving against all odds." The banner. Moses said, "Listen, we're going into hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is not going to be a pretty battle, and when it gets really difficult, I want you to be able to look up on the hill." And see the staff. Next day the battle starts. And it is a battle. It's not the kind of battle that we think of in today's modern warfare. It's more like the clip I showed you. If you know your Civil War, it's Gettysburg type of battle. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat. Thousands of people just crashing together. And you're able to see. I've read books about Gettysburg. And they said from a hillside, they could see who was winning the battle. Same is true of this battle. And when Moses had his hands up high, when Moses had his hands up high, they were able to see the staff, be reminded of the purpose. They had the motivation to fight. And when his arms went down, the Bible says they begin to lose the battle. Why is that? Because there was some magic potion that was going out there? No. Because it was real life, real fight. And when they didn't see the staff anymore, they thought maybe we lost. Maybe it's true God is not with us. And their ability to trust, their ability to see God for who he is, oh, and so they didn't fight as hard. They began to maybe pull back. And when you do that, you lose. But then when Moses' hand went back up, it said that Aaron and her got a rock, stuck it up underneath Moses' rear end so he could kind of sit on it. They took his arms and they held them up for him. And so Aaron and her holding up Moses says, why all the drama? Just because it's a great story? Makes for a good coloring book in your Sunday school class? No. It's not about drama. It's about real life. The people down in the valley need to see and feel and know God is for us. God's power is here. This is my motivation. This is what I need to be able to move forward. And so with Moses' arms up, the Bible says they were, Joshua was able to lead them to victory. Verse 13. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his army. And I want you to remember this word, with 
the sword. It's very clear. The battle is over. Moses builds an altar. And then he names it. This is, this is back to the bizarro. The Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. God is our banner. Jehovah Nisi. Why would he do that? Why would he name God? When he viewed God in this battle, and you should know like the other names, the only time. The word banner is used throughout. It's just a normal word. Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my rallying cry. The Lord is my flag, my banner. It is the visual purpose that I can see when I can't trust anything. That's bizarre that Moses, but in this battle, he realized what was happening. Arms go up, we're winning. Arms go down because what they believed, watch, what they believed about God could be seen by this visual and so Moses knew when they believed and knew that God was with them, they began to be able to push forward. No retreats. It's a worthy cause. And listen, this battle is different than the other battle I told you about two weeks ago with Gideon. There Gideon makes an altar and it's Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah is our peace. And remember that battle? They get 300 of them going against thousands and thousands, and they get a torch and some pots. They go, hey, go over there, break the, uh, put the pot over the torch, break the pot, uh, for Gideon, blah, blah, blah. 300 go in, no one dies. They don't even fight, <laughs> and God does it all. Sometimes God does it all like that, right? We sang that song, and I want to make sure we understand when I fight, I fight on my knees. Absolutely, we're praying. And there's sometimes you just stay still and you rest. You're like Gideon, I fight on my knees. And the battle will be won sometimes. Not every time. You can't read the Old Testament that way. On this one, on this one, Israelites were dying. When this game, when this, when this, not game, when this fight was over and they were fist pumping and going, hey, the Lord is our banner, that's amazing. There was a bunch of people dead, a bunch of Israelites dead. It's kind of like when the Marines take Iwo Jima, they win the battle. We could open up an airfield there. And there's a celebration. But over on the other side of the island, there's 7,000 Marines dead. That's this story. This isn't Gideon's story. There's time when I fight my battle, I fight on my knees. That's awesome. And sometimes you do that. Other times, you're praying while you have a responsibility to move. And you move because Jehovah Nisi, God is my banner. I see him. I know him. And he is my purpose. He is my motivation to do what he's asked me to do. So I want to make sure that we understand that there are times in the crucibles of life, you absolutely want to stay prayed up, but there's times sometimes, not every time, you, get a, you got to get off your knees, and you're like, here's what I need to do, and I can do it because God is leading me to do it. I have actions in my prayerful steps. So God, my banner is what? What can, we, what can we glean about God's character here? What principle can we glean? Because my guess is tomorrow you're not going into hand-to-hand -hand combat. And just like Gideon, you're not doing that. But what can we glean? Well, one of the things we need to understand is that many times in the challenges and the crucible of life, even though God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and he is our banner, he is our motivation, People still die. You don't win every battle in the sense of the battle here. If you want to make it spiritual and you're going to go to heaven, absolutely. Too many times we sing these songs. We have the poor teaching of Old Testament, which is I just got to have faith and I'm going. Sometimes you die in the sense of it doesn't go the way you want it to go. But God is my banner is always faithful. God is King Jesus. So remember, Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus hasn't changed. 
He is King Jesus and he loves you. And he's always faithful. And many times it is this faithfulness in the valley of chaos when we're not sure what to do. When we know there's nothing we can do, you look and God is your motivation to keep trusting. That's this story, remember? Red sea, manna, quail, water, still belly aching, still no trust. Is God with us? Oh, you want to see if I'm with you or not? Watch this battle. Watch this battle. God is my banner is worthy of full devotion. Worthy of full devotion. You see, this is a motivational thing. Am I all in? You want to use the soldier motif of these battles? You better be all in. You don't have to like it, but you have a purpose, right? So when you think of God, is he, watch this, is God and who God is your motivation to do what you were supposed to do and to sacrifice and to give or move forward, moral life, whatever it is? Is he worthy enough? This is a bizarre word. A lot of people want to gloss over it. God is my banner. And you can't make banner say what it doesn't say. He is our rallying war cry. He's our motivation to stay engaged in the game of life. When we think we want to stop, we can keep moving. Yet we have our shared responsibility, love, serve, give, and share. Love, serve, give, and share. You see, many of those words, what those are, we only do those things. We only give of our finances back to the church when we really believe God is worthy and the cause is worthy. We, we serve when we really believe God is worthy and the cause is worthy of my life. Then I will say, he is my motivation to be all that he's created me to be. This morning, we lost a, an hour of sleep cold and raining. So we got here. The band was here. I said, hey, thanks for coming. This is awesome. All volunteer band. And then I reminded them. I said, look outside during our prayer over here. We had parking team people pouring down rain with their raincoats on, helping and greeting people and doing parking and with, and with umbrellas. You see, you do that when everybody else wants to stay in bed and get an extra hour of sleep and it's nice and cozy and warm. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But you get up and put on that raincoat and stand in the cold rain after you lost an hour of sleep when you know the Lord is worthy. We've lost that, friends. He's worthy of your best. He's worthy. And that sign. So it could be love, serve, give, share, all of those. He's worthy of our full devotion. My banner, God, my banner is my purpose. Everybody, what's your purpose? Have you found your purpose in life? What's your purpose? We need to stop asking so much, what is your purpose or what is my purpose, and say, what is God's purpose? What's God's purpose as I love? What's God's purpose for my finances? What's God's purpose for my serving? We've created a whole church culture that it's all about the person and not about God. And we got to move back. Is he worthy? What is the purpose and when you answer that question, then in the, the quick uh, uh, a volcanic sand of life, when it's hard and difficult, you keep moving forward. You know why this doesn't get taught a lot? It's because it's hard. It's hard to have this motivation to understand my banner, God, my banner is with me. He is with me always. And sometimes, 300 people go into the battle, show a light, show a clay pot, no one gets hurt. It's awesome. Other times, in the valley of the shadow of death, people get hurt. It's a brutal world we live in. But Jehovah Nisi, God is my banner. He's my banner when no one gets hurt. He's my banner when everyone's getting hurt, and I keep moving forward. That's why no one wants to actually teach this one. It's your motivation. 
to have this purpose. God is with me. God is with me. Remember, that was their cry of the heart. It's like my cry of my heart and yours. God, are you with me or not? They kept complaining and whining, forgetting about what God had done. And they cried out one more time, are you with me? In the middle of the battle, they were able to look up and go, oh, yeah, he's with us. Look, we're winning. When we have faith and we have trust, we are winning the overall battle. Not everybody lived that day. Got to make sure you keep telling you that. Not everybody lived that day. As I read through this story and I think about this name, one big question comes flying out. What you really believe about God matters. What you and I really believe about God in the crucible, in the challenging time, what we really believe about God matters, of what he's asking us to do, where he's leading and guiding us. And many times we don't know where he's leading and guiding us. We're just following him. What you really believe about God matters. It matters. It matters when you're on your phone and you're wondering, is anybody watching what I'm doing on my phone? God is. God sees. So we love the fact that God sees us. Three weeks ago, El Roy, God sees, but he sees us. And so when I really believe about God, what I really believe about God then changes what I do when no one else is watching. Great definition for integrity, right? What I really believe about God dictates what I do with my love, serve, give, and share. What I really believe. What I really believe. You're sitting here. I was thinking about we were having some fun with it this today. Losing an hour of sleep. People act like that's getting your head chopped off. It's an hour of sleep. Losing an hour of sleep. Pouring down rain. You know why you find people got here? Because you really believe church matters. You believe God matters. That, that, that's just, again, no one wants to hear it, but that's just true. I don't let the weather dictate if I go to church or not. I don't let the, if I have an extra hour of sleep, if I really believe the Lord's going to meet me here and church matters. You see, what we really believe determines what we do at work tomorrow. What we really believe determines how you make it in the crucibles of life. When you can't handle it and there's no way out, God, are you with me? And then he says, oh, I'm with you. I've never left you. You just have to have faith. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. No one moving around. I want you to think to yourself, Maybe some of you are in it now. When have you been in those crucibles? When have you been in those challenges in your life? Where the cry of your heart was, God, are you with me or not? God, are you with me or not? When is that for you? Can you bring that image to your mind? Maybe it's when everybody else seems to be getting rewarded for doing the wrong thing, but you keep doing the right thing, and it seems like it just keeps getting worse. Maybe it's when death or disease hits your family, and there's nothing you can do except to look to your motivation. Is God who he said he is? Is he with me? How you answer that question, friends, will determine how you move in life. God, we ask you to, during this worship set, to speak to us, to reveal to us, to show us. We ask it in your name. Amen.